So we have our next group coming in. Uh, we have the Kyoto Creatives coming in. Hey, Felicity, how are you doing? Hey, Joy, how are Robert you? Robert and Emily, fantastic. Let's see if we can get everybody in a frame. Hey, great to connect with you guys. Yay, Kyoto Hi, in the house. Hi, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Hi Felicity, haven't met you before, so I'm happy to see you. Oh, you guys have not met Perfect. before. No. Congratulations, I was... Joy. Oh, I just, thank I just you. said it with 500. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Now you guys are all based in Kyoto, doing very different things. Um, but I've loved talking to all of you, and I think you all inspire us all. Now everybody's kind of focused on Kyoto for many things. Have you noticed uh, since over tourism? Are you seeing a big change in Kyoto these days? It's in the news all the time, all the negative stuff, right? But how do you feel as, as Kyoto locals? I think that half of Kyoto is very full and half of Kyoto is very empty. When I went through Kyoto Station today, I felt the pressure of all the people and it was quite stressful. I really don't like going to Kyoto Station that often. But then there are parts of Kyoto that even during the crazy, crazy time around April, Sakura season, uh, nobody goes. Um, so I think it's finding those off the beaten track spots that still exist, even in Kyoto, um, that you can really enjoy the city as it's meant to be enjoyed. I think so too. Robert, uh, I love your Instagram updates. You always give us an update on the Philosopher's Path, which is right in front of your gallery. Um, how is it in your neck of the woods in Kyoto? Are you seeing things manageable? Okay. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, we're in an area where there's no trains or subways. Um, we're on a patch of the Philosopher's Path where the buses and taxis don't stop. That's only 50, 60 meters down the road, that's where it gets rather crowded. So if I ride my bicycle or take a walk, um, yeah, I'll find more people walking down there. But, you know, I, I don't really go downtown, but like Felicity just said, we were in the station the other day and I was down in um, uh, downtown last night to see a great uh, concert at Urban Guild, one of the great uh, um, live house places. Um, a, a gentleman named Christopher Fryman took together um, three year, two years to put together called Zen Ensemble, and they just released an album called Garden of Time. A great musician in Kyoto. But like Felicity said, yeah, there's lots of crazy places uh, just uh, inundated with foreigners. Obviously, I don't go that. I live a pretty simple life, uh, so I don't get out that much to those places. But our area here, uh, in the Ginkakuji area is, is quaint, quiet. Uh, a lot of the time, you know, it gets really crowded during uh, Sakura and uh, Momiji season, uh, Koyo. But otherwise, you can stroll along the Philosopher's Path at certain times of the day, only see a few people, and just be in awe and wonder. And I got to say, lucky me, three women in the room, just me as a guy? Look, I'm like, it's nice to see Emily. I haven't seen you for a while. And no, it's been too for long. The, for the film, haven't seen you for a while either. So, um, you know, and the, the people that come to my gallery know about it and it's kind of a destination. So um, we're just very grateful to share, you know, the culture with people in my specific field um, mm. and, um, you know, try to bring a little beauty and joy and peace into people's daily lives. Yeah, and I just visited Kyoto City recently, and I love walking all the back streets, and I'm always impressed by all these amazing gems, these cultural gems that don't exist anywhere else in Japan. It's still alive in Kyoto. Now, uh, Emily, you're in rural Kyoto, so I imagine you're not seeing an over-tourism uh, problem like the city might be seeing, right? Not at all. Um, we have a little, you know, local roads, roadside station, you know, um, and that's inundated every weekend, uh, Saturday, Sunday. It's, it's crazy. And um, we also have a, um, two main roads that go into the city. And one of them is like a one lane, a one laner. So, you know, when I commute into the city for work, it's like at 630 in the morning and there's no one there and everybody else is also commuting and so we know 
where to pull over for one another. But on the weekends, it's it's madness. It's mostly Japanese people. It's madness. You know, occasionally we do get uh, very interesting hordes of foreign drivers. They were driving classic cars one weekend, and I I meant to look up like what's going on, and I I missed it. But there's some interesting activity that you see since you're in the countryside. That's certainly Kyoto specific. You know, but. Is that, yeah, a Michi, a, Michi, is that a Michi no Eki? Is that what they call it? Michi no Eki. Yeah, Woody. We are Woody. <laughs> <laughs> but don't, isn't it great when you have all these subcultures in Japan that you suddenly stumble upon, like a classic car convention or something in the middle of rural Kyoto? That's really some of the things I love about Japan. Um, now, I want to ask you guys about things you're excited about with what you're doing these days. Uh, Felicity, you, you're just about to launch a, a new film, is that right? Yeah. So my documentary, which is called We Exist in English and Watashi Tachi no Ibasho in Japanese, is coming out on July 13th. And it's the topic is LGBTQI plus A plus visibility in Japan. And the goal of myself and my collaborator, Tiffany, uh, was to share stories, to be a positive uh, platform for storytelling. And we wanted to leave Tokyo, leave Kyoto, get out of the cities and go into rural parts of Japan. So the first episode of what we hope will become a documentary series uh, is split between Tokyo and Matsuyama in Ehime Prefecture. And it is, uh, I hope, very insightful. I learned a lot making it, um, especially talking with members of the LGBTQIA plus community in Japan who uh, you got on the kind of on the forefront. So we interviewed the first transgender city councillor in Shikoku. Uh, Watanabe Hiroyuki, and her story where she was in the nightlife for 30 years and she was a bar owner and then COVID happened and that kind of propelled her into politics and then she became the representative of LGBT issues um, in, her, in her city because Matsuyama still doesn't have the partnership program, which 75% of Japan now has the partnership program where people can at least have some certificate that says they're a couple. So lots of topics like that. Uh, we talk to uh, people all throughout the community, people on the street, and hopefully through this documentary, we'll yeah share some stories and share a little bit of awareness. That's great. Thank you, Felicity. Fantastic. Uh, you, you're always doing such great projects and the visual arts are so important for spreading the message, right? Robert, did you want to say something? No, I just said fantastic, Felicity. You know, Thanks, uh, Robert. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to it with people. People are Thanks people. So love is love, and nobody should deny love, whatever right. shape or form it comes in. Agreed. Absolutely. Uh, Robert, you are always giving us beautiful updates on your Instagram channel about your latest works. Anything uh, happening now in your gallery you're excited about? All the time. I'm constant awe. I mean, I got a Jomon pot the other day. I mean, seriously, like I'm holding a piece made 3,000 years ago, which is at the end of the Jomon period. If you want, I'll go get it. Yeah. And um yeah, Just go get it. We want to see it. Go <laughs> get it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> go get it. That's amazing. Can I quickly share a, a memory of Robert while he's getting his Of pot? course you can. Okay. Yes. So we did a little documentary about Robert, actually, a little intro to him. And we went to his gallery and we did a, se a section where he was blindfolded and we put a sake cup in his hand. And he could tell just from the tips of his fingers who made it. Uh, where did it come from? Which gallery? So the passion is, is deep and true and real. Eyes on your fingertips. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, um, that's pretty crazy. I mean, that's a great know. party trick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is a oh. Jomon pot. Wow. And it's very light. Of course, it was 
meant for storing something, probably seeds of this form. It has the rope pattern on it. It's kind of more of a traditional form, not the wild, crazy, um, you know, uh, fire flame pieces. You know, the, the lip has a little, um, you know, battle scar damage, but who wouldn't at 3,000 yeah. years old? Yeah. And it's just, it's so precious to hold something like this and imagine the mystery and where it came from and mm. and it, it came from oh, it, it came from al morty that's what the box said but more so of not where it came from but who held it that mystery of where it came from and um you know to, to be in awe of what beauty humanity has the potential of creating and sharing throughout the centuries um is is something that i find very profound every day um Beautiful. so yeah, there's, there's something always happening at the gallery. Some people came in today, uh, first time to Japan, first time to Asia, um, traveling uh, a family, and th they were just so in, in, enriched, they said, by just looking at the history of Japanese ceramics and um, how a cup is not really just a cup. It's a, it's a vessel of poetry and, and a vessel of spirituality and a vessel of mindfulness. And uh, yeah, I mean, how could you not be just engaged so much every day in Japan with what we're doing, Felicity and Emily, um, and and alive? Uh, so uh, you know, it's kind of a quiet time right now with the summer up, you know, midsummer and everything. Um, getting ready for the spring. Uh, I'm sorry, autumn. Uh, you know, I, I just approach every day like a blank sheet of paper and see what creations I can do or what's going to happen. I'm not a very good planner. Uh, there's a Jackson Brown's line about that. You know, please forgive me if I, oh, anyway. So uh, I, I don't have any mission or, or, you know, exhibitions or anything that are on the horizon. Um, I'm just going with the flow. That sounds like you've got enough going on. You've got your hands on beautiful, works of art. You talk with living legends, potters around Japan. You have them visit your gallery. You've always got something going on, Robert. It's amazing. <laughs> Tennis too. And I'm, Tennis drinking, too. I'm drinking sake from a 16th century karatsu piece with that kintsugi. And you know, something that's really interesting that's happening around the world is that kintsugi is so popular. People come into the gallery and they're like, do you have any kintsugi pieces? And, you know, we talk about um, uh, healing and, and taking something that's scarred, maybe broken, and making it beautiful again. And um, a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists in the, in the West are using this as a metaphor. You know, everybody's dealing with something, whether it's visible or inside of you. And how do you deal with that to heal yourself? So it's a great metaphor. This is a 450-year-old sake cup kampai. Kampai. Thank Kampai. you so much, Robert. It's amazing. Kin, kin <laughs> Sugi is all about like healing yourself and, and finding a way to reuse, which is very sustainable. Awesome. Uh, Emily, what's what's going on with you? You just were, I saw you at the Minka Summit. Yeah. Uh, you have your second book published. Congratulations. Thank you very you much. You did a wonderful plastering workshop. Uh, you really inspired people, and every you. day you're out working with natural plaster, right? I've actually shifted focus a little bit for the last few months because I've got two buns in the oven. What? <laughs> Congratulations! Wow! Thank you very much. Yeah. So, so then what's exciting is like that's, that's coming along, of course, that's the most mind-blowing thing ever. Um, <laughs> the, the, That's the amazing. Souls, the souls were waiting to get in. We were talking about that. Like, so if this is reincarnation, where did they come from? Where's the last time we were all together? You know, like all these crazy things we'll never know, but maybe we will. Who knows? But anyways, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a very life-changing event, I must say. But what's really cool... Um, Having moved to this Kehoku, I had no idea uh, what was in store for us here because, you know, my husband Yose is carpenter, I'm plastering, and, you know, we're in woody area. <laughs> uh, so it's perfect for him. And also for me, there are just innumerable 
houses that need plaster work. Um, some are empty, and what we really want, have you know, what he's talked about for a long time, and and I'm completely on board is uh, finding a way to make opportunities for people to get experience in the crafts that that we have come to know. And what's incredible is that in our own valley right here, just this one valley of Kehoku, there are people who have already created the foundation for us to work upon. So basically we just have to create programs. Like there's already a house that's ready to be started renovating. And there's a person that has, you know, been envisioning that project for a while now. And here we come stepping in, offering one of the, you know, big pieces to make that happen. And then plus all the different collaborations around that too. And the, there's a lot of really wonderful um, land artists, I guess is one way to put it here in this community, people who uh, draw their craft and their thinking patterns from the environment and are really skilled at navigating um, the information that's there and sharing it with all different kinds of people, um, you know, including university level, um, you know, we we have a, a crafts community, just, you know, social media and such. Um, there's a, a group of carpenters that from the U.S. and the Kezurokai USA group that want to come and help us with our restoration house. We have this living house, the house we live in, and then we have our restoration project house, One Valley Over. Um, so that's something that we haven't been able to touch yet because there's so much to do at our living house. But that's, you know, we know that's going to be, you know, we're going to be able to put energy towards that next year. Um, I will do my best. With yeah, that's so exciting. My hands full. But yeah, it, it's super exciting. Uh, lots of, lots of, um, you know, long-term projects, which is really, you know, fun to know that, that we can create you know, long-term effects, you know. Yeah. Now, Felicity and Robert, that's one of the things that Emily was talking about when she was on the show is about how she went to this training school, this amazing plaster training school, and then it went out of business, right? So are you starting to see in Kyoto of all areas, are you guys starting to see more interest in bringing back these workshop type schools? They seem like so important right now is we're losing a lot of the traditional knowledge, right? Well, as, as you know, um, a good friend, Steve Bymel, started Japan Craft 21, revitalization of, of, of skills, and that's really important. Um, I don't really deal so much on that side. Uh, you know, a lot of potters come and they ask, where can I study this and that? And I... Um, direct them towards another website called Explore Japanese Ceramics, where they can get hands-on experience. And um, a lot of these traditional potters are, are are having a hard time, actually. There was a gentleman from Seto who visited the other day. He does very traditional uh, oribe and, and, and um, something called koseto. And he doesn't really have any apprentices, you know, nobody to follow. But I know there are a lot of uh, potters who are very interested to come here. I mean, it, one thing is the language barrier. One thing is visas, things like that. So I direct them to this one website. Um, yes, there's a great interest around the world, of course, as you know, in, in Japanese traditional culture and, and the crafts. And it's just a, a matter of getting people um, able to touch it and feel it and, and, and purchase them or learn learn about them. Uh, um, so I, I do take some clients out to studios and visit them and things of that nature. But certainly there's a huge interest. And as Steve said on Japan Crafts 21, there's no country in the world with a great level and depth and variety of craftsmanship and shokunin craftspeople than in Japan. Um, we just uh, ordered um, some new name cards, meishi, and I specifically wanted uh, washi paper. So I had to wait a month for a craftsman in Eichizen to make the paper for a card. So whatever you can do in a little way, uh, it actually goes a long way. It's worth it. It'll be worth it. Uh, Felicity, how about like in your more creative sector? Like, are you finding like writing workshops or people who are interested in filmmaking or other kind of 
like media? Are there, is there workshops or training for you guys? In English, no. Perhaps there are in the semongako and such in Japanese. Um, but it's something that I've been thinking about and I think other people are, are starting to think about as well, similar to what um, Chuck was saying in the previous segment about having kind of mixing teaching with gardening, with, with farm um, knowledge. Um, you know, there's a couple of English-based experience schools aimed at children. It's just starting up here in Kyoto um so like web design and they i think they have a drama class now and i think that that would i think like robert was just saying there's a huge interest in coming to japan um so if you had a writer's workshop in japan i think people would come uh it's just yeah just getting it set up yeah but kind of connecting to what you were saying before with with uh crafts people i've started working with a a travel company that takes people into into crafts like the, the homes of craftsmen and uh and i interpret for them as they do the experience so we've done like nishiji and ori which is a very specific kind of weaving that's almost like watercolor it's so uh there's so much variance with the the threads um and kintsugi and things like that and Everybody who is providing the experiences, they're quite they're quite elderly, and it is a concern. Like in in ten, twenty, thirty years, who's going to be around to pass on this knowledge? Uh, who the the interest in these experiences is huge, but who will be providing those experiences? So uh, Japan maybe needs as a country to to like kind of focus in on this, and maybe there should be more government support subsidies. Like Robert was saying, like extend visas so that foreigners can come in and be apprentices. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was a really big point that that stuck to me from the the first group that was on. They were talking about uh, a shift in, or like a shift is happening, but there needs to be more of this uh, allowance for foreigners to come in and and learn these crafts because the, the international. The interest is huge. The desire is enormous. People are always contacting me for, you know, plastering side too, and and you know I know that's true for all these other, you know, areas and um, crafts and sectors, and it, it really needs to become a priority like today, you know, like as because of that the age issue that you're talking about, Felicity. It's 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 true. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Robert, yeah. are you seeing that with the potters? Are they like taking on new apprentices? Are they passing on the knowledge or are potter studios, are they closing down because they just don't have enough people to train or what's all happening the, in your all sector? All of the above. All of the above. <laughs> so I got a, uh, I, I was quite surprised. I got um, uh, a letter I can show you with a boshu. Uh, for a potter in Kyushu looking for apprentices. He goes, can you help me find somebody? And, and you know, a well-known potter, uh, probably in his 70s, and he lives in the mountains somewhere, and he just can't find anybody to come and apprentice. He's got a beautiful studio, beautiful, you know, surroundings, uh, a tea house he built, and uh, he sent me this. Uh, and yeah, it's 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 very hard uh, for a lot of these, um, you know, not a, not only the potters but uh, the box makers, um, the 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 wood cord uh, uh, dealers, uh, the clay vendors. They're all seventies, eighties, and there's nobody to take it over, and they're they're done if that happens. And it's it's a loss really uh, to the cultural rainbow of the world. Uh, when those things die. Of course, that's inevitable sometimes. J Japan has gone through certain upheavals throughout its history. Not everything has survived. They have to um, adapt and, and uh, evolve. Any tradition does, because tradition is a living thing. And, uh, but if there's not enough people to follow in that tradition and maybe you know, uh, morph it into something more relevant to today, if that doesn't happen, it, it just goes by the wayside. 
And, uh, you know, my kind of mission is to support living artists as much as I can. I mean, I love Joe Moon Potts, but if I just showed these all the time, it doesn't really benefit anybody. So the main goal of my gallery is to support living artists because tradition is a living thing. And I'm not just talking about pottery, but if a tradition does not evolve, uh, it either becomes uh, useless or it disappears or it becomes dangerous. Uh, and I'm not talking just about pottery. Any tradition that does not evolve to meet the needs of the current day uh, will uh, become one of the things I just mentioned. And that's... But Jose likes to say tradition is evolution. Yeah, well, it, it, it certainly should be, you know. Um, uh, so, yeah, it, it's, it's hard. A lot of potters are taking on part-time jobs or they're just like, what's the point i can't sell a 3000 yen handmade beautiful dish people are going to the 100 yen shop and they're thinking that's the better buy when in reality they're they they don't understand the long term of it all and taking care of something you buy something you pay a little extra money you might even know the maker you're going to use it with love and compassion and joy that's a great word joy yeah. we should all use things with great joy <laughs> Great job. Uh, you know, and I'm trying and, to live up to my name. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're doing a great job. Ah, okay? Thank you. I think, so. I think you're doing a wonderful job. Um, so, you know, pay a little extra and it, it supports a culture. It supports a potting area. It, you, you know somebody who made the piece and you'll use it with care and, and maybe pass it on to, to somebody in the future. You know, if you buy something for 100 yen or, or you know, un unfortunately plastic, you don't really care, you know. And, and if you don't care what goes on in your kitchen in some respect, then you don't really care about your uh, association with nature and, 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 and culture, you know. Absolutely. The foundation of sustainability right there, Robert. Thank you for summing it all up so beautifully for us. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining this segment, this Creative Kyoto. You guys are doing a great job. Thank you so much for joining the special 500th. You guys are amazing. Likewise. Amazing. Thank Lots you. Of Lots thank of love, you. everyone. Okay. Lots of love. Thank you, everybody. All right.